Hello and welcome to the monthly Southwest Drought Briefing. I'm Emily Elias, Director of the USDA Southwest Climate Hub. These monthly briefings emerged during the 2020 Southwest Drought from the Monitoring and Impact Reporting Team of the Southwest Drought Learning Network. The Drought Learning Network links climate service providers with resource managers and resource managers with one another to increase landscape and community resilience during current and future drought. We begin this briefing by respectfully acknowledging that the land we are joining from today is the ancestral land of indigenous peoples. As we are in different parts of the country, this will be different for each of us. The land where I'm speaking from is the ancestral land of the Nuchu or Ute, and connected to the communal and ceremonial spaces of the Apache, the Pueblos, Hopi, and the Diné Nation. I believe it's important to provide this acknowledgement because the narratives of this land and region are often told without acknowledging this history. Thank you for your attention and respect. I want to take a moment to thank my colleague, Gretel Fallingstad. Gretel is the Drought Early Warning System Coordinator for the Intermountain West Region at NIDIS, the National Integrated Drought Information System. She will be moderating the questions at the end of this briefing, and please use the question feature at any time during the talks. Following this briefing, a recording will be available online at drought.gov. Today, we hear from two presenters. Our usual moderator, Dr. Joel Lizenby, will present our current climate conditions and outlook. He is the Drought Early Warning System Coordinator for the Southern Plains region at NIDIS. Following Joel's presentation, we'll hear from Dr. Henry Regis about COCORAS, the Community Collaborative Rain, Hail, and Snow Network. Henry is the U.S. National Coordinator for COCORAS and a meteorologist. COCORAS is now in its 25th year of engaging citizen scientists to measure and report precipitation at their location on a daily basis using a simple plastic rain gauge and the internet. With over 25,000 active, active observers, the network has come, become the largest provider of daily precipitation measurements in the United States. Volunteers also measure in Canada, Puerto Rico, the U.S. Virgin Islands, the Bahamas, and Guam. In addition to precipitation observers, uh, in, in addition to precipitation, observers also report conditions such as wet or dry, in their local area, helping to keep an eye on developing drought. Henry says there can never be enough observers, especially in the Southwest United States, where precipitation observations can be few and far between. With that, I'll turn it over to Joel for the climate conditions outlook and update. Thank you, Emily. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, I'm going to be talking mostly about drought, but before I talk about drought, I have to talk about the weather that we've recently had, uh, which has been kind of crazy. So we've had a few atmospheric rivers. By a few, I mean since October, we've had over 10, um, and I, I honestly stopped counting. Uh, we may be at like 13 or 14 right now. Uh, we had another atmospheric river hit the West Coast just this last weekend. On the top left, I'm showing the a total precipitable water uh, vapor map as measured from satellites from March 10th through to today. You can see that filament coming across the Pacific Ocean. Um, sometimes we call that the Pineapple Express because it's, it's sending water vapor from Hawaii up to California. Um, the map or the image on, on the bottom is, uh, is a region just north of Monterey, California that experienced some flood from floods from that, uh, that latest atmospheric river. And we have another on, on the way. So on the right side of this slide, I'm showing what's expected for this week. Uh, the yellow and orange colors represent the, um, the vertically integrated total water vapor transport in kilograms per meters per second. So it's how much water is coming through the atmosphere within that filament. And we have an area in the middle of that, the dark reds, that is over 800 kilograms of water per meter per second um, coming through that will probably land in California um, sometime tomorrow. This is a forecast map from 30 hours from right now, so that's about what we'd expect. What does that mean for precipitation? This is a, a precipitation forecast for the next day, so today and tomorrow. Well, you can see across Northern California, some areas of uh, greater than two inches are expected, and as we look for the whole next week out, 
we're expecting another four inches across California and areas across the Great Basin, the Intermountain West, that may see um, somewhere between one and two, even exceeding two inches in some high places. Um, something that's a little bit different about the expected atmospheric river is the freezing point is pretty high, uh, is a pretty high altitude, which means um, if you're in a lower mountain location, you're likely to see a rain on snow event coming uh, with this upcoming atmospheric river. Now I mentioned I was going to be talking about drought. Let's let's step back and look at what's what changes have we seen in the drought over the last uh, three months. So on the far left of this slide, I'm showing uh, the drought conditions from the U.S. Drought Monitor from the beginning of winter. This is December 13th. In the middle is a change map from the 13th to now, and on the on the right is the current conditions. So it's the the drought drought categories from the U.S. Drought Monitor uh, from last week, March 7th. And um, you can see the biggest changes are in California, which is just a little bit outside the, the scope of what we usually consider the Southwest, but it sort of stands out. If you were in Fresno in early December, you were in exceptional B4 drought. But if you're in Fresno now, you're seeing no drought and in fact, you're dealing with floods. Across the other Southwest state, we've seen a general drought improvement with exception to some parts in Southern Colorado that have seen a, a little bit of a worsening in drought categories. I want to look at um, a few integrated time periods. We're going to start with with the water year to date and how have this how has this water year progressed? And we're going to look at winter and then we're going to look at at the last month. So what we're looking at now is precipitation totals. It's it, not totals actually. It's a departure from normal. It's a precipitation anomalies from the beginning of the water year, which is October first, up to the end of February. And uh, well, sorry, the map on the left actually goes all the way through last week, but the the graph on the right just takes us up to the end of February. Um, generally across the Intermountain West and the Southwest, we've seen average to above average precipitation through this, uh, this water year, uh, which is, has been really nice to see because at the beginning of winter, um, in fact, all the way back in October, we saw that we were coming into a third La Nina winter and we were expecting that to be another dry winter, but it hasn't played out that way. In fact, looking at the graph on the left, uh, sorry, the right, the light blue line is this water year to date with the dark line in the middle, the average, we're sitting a little bit above average across the, the Southwest. Um, I'll just be clear that the date or the, the, the region uh, summarized in that graph is the states of Utah, Colorado, Nevada, not, no, not Nevada, Arizona and New Mexico. So it's those four states averaged. And, and we can see that we're sitting just a little bit above average for this point in the water year. Uh, February marked the end of the meteorological winter, which we considered to be de December, January, and February. Um, through winter, we had a, a pretty stark east-west divide across the country, where the eastern part of the country was pretty warm, and some places claimed they didn't even have a winter, whereas the western part of the country saw a cool, wet winter uh, for most of the time. Um, it was cooler and wetter in January than, than what we saw well, we saw more precipitation in January than we saw in December and February, but it stayed cool across the whole winter. In fact, we can rank this by state to see how the states worked out. Looking at the temperatures in the, the Southwest states, we saw mostly average to a little below average uh, temperatures across the Southwest. New Mexico is a little bit of an exception to that, which we saw just average to a little bit above average. Looking at precipitation though, it's a little bit of a different story. Um, just the way that the National Center for Environmental Information makes these maps, it's ranked that the wettest it comes up at, at ranks at 128 and the driest is one. And I couldn't flip that. So I put some numbers over that to flip that in our head. If we wanted to see which, which states worked out to be finished their winter in the top 10 wettest, um, Nevada ended in the eighth, with its eighth wettest winter. Utah ended with its ninth wettest winter. Those are the two that fell into the top 10. California and Colorado ended with the 11th wettest winters um, on record for them. So it's been a really nice winter across most of the uh, across most of the Western United States, especially the southwestern states. Shortening our time period just a little bit, we're looking now at just the month of February and how February ended. Um, places that saw a, a, a lot of well, so February compa compared to January was just a little bit drier. There were places that saw four times as much their average January precipitation in January that saw just a little bit uh, above half of what they would expect in, in um, February. And I'm looking specifically at Nevada, Utah, Colorado, Arizona, New Mexico here. When you look at California, there's a bit of a standout. of They, they continued to have a really wet winter across central California. 
but something that is consistent across winter is that it stayed pretty cool and uh, in some places very, very cold, which means that the precipitation that we received stayed around. It, the, the snow fell and, and for the most part it stayed in the landscape, which was pretty nice. It's what you want to see in a good winter where you're trying to replenish your, your water in the landscape. Now looking at the last 30 days, so this would include the last half of February and the first half of, of March, taking us up to, um, to the 10th. You can see that cool and, and wet pattern generally continuing. The exceptions to this is in Southeast New Mexico, which has generally been warm and dry, where the rest of the Southwest has been warm, uh, cool and wet. Snowpack is the big story here. Um, I'm gonna go through these kind of quickly, but I'm gonna break down the snowpack basin by basin because each basin is a little bit different. I'm gonna start with the upper Colorado River Basin. Uh, we're still about a month away from the average peak of the snowpack season, and we're at 132% of the long-term median to this time of the season. Um, the upper Colorado River Basin is pretty far from any snowpack records, but it's better than what we've seen in the last several years, and we're pretty happy with where the snowpack is at the moment. Uh, the southern Colorado, the lower Colorado River Basin is, is a different story. Uh, we've seen a lot of snow across parts of the southern basin, and we're currently sitting at 245% of average, and we're now past the average peak of the season, uh, which usually happens about four days ago from now, so like about the 9th or so of March. The Rio Grande uh, Basin is not doing terrible, but it's not great either. It's not like the Colorado River Basin is. Uh, we're sitting pretty close to the average for the average peak for the season, and we're still about half a month away from seeing from the, the usual date of that peak. Um, most of these storms over this last winter have come in from the west. They've come in off of the, the Pacific coast and moved over the Rocky Mountains, which means by the time they get over the continent, continental divide, there's not as much precipitation in them as, the, as what we see on the west side of the divide. So right now I'm showing the Arkansas White and Red River basins, which get most of their snow from the east side of the continental divide in southern Colorado and northern New Mexico. And the, the Arkansas River Basin is not faring too well right now. We're currently sitting at only 78% of the long-term average. One of the real standouts is um, the Great Basin. I think I, oh, I tried to update this. I don't think it did. The, this, this is a, a graph that I, I put together on Friday and we've actually seen more snow come on Friday and we've, uh, over the weekend actually, and we've seen quite a big increase to this. We're now sitting at the highest snowpack on record across the Great Basin um, for this time of the season. Uh, on Friday, we're at 180% of the, the average for, or of the, the median for this, for this part of the season. Uh, most of that is being, is caught up in the Sierra Nevadas in the west and the Wasatch Range um, in, in, in the east and part of the basin. I want to do a quick, a few quick comparisons. These are some previous years that had similar snowpack trends to now. Uh, the one that was really odd was 1983, where most of the the heavy precipitation fell in spring. Um, that only has happened once on our records, whereas most of the snow starts melting out around uh, after the first of April or so. Um, I also want to do a quick comparison of just the last 10 years across the Great Basin. And um, there's a, of the last 10 years, only two years have been above median, and that was 2017 and 2019. All of the rest were below median throughout the whole season. In fact, uh, just a quick back of the envelope calculation shows that we've had more snow this season in the Great Basin than we have the last two seasons combined. And of course that snow is going to hit, make its way down into the reservoirs, which is what we're gonna be watching for through spring. Um, this is looking at the Bureau of Reclamation managed reservoirs across the Intermountain West. The two big ones are Lake Mead and Lake Powell. They're currently sitting below 50% of their long-term average, although they have seen some slight increase over the last few months. Um, but the real filling time of, for these seasons is April through for, for these for these reservoirs is April through July. So that's really what we're going to be watching is how does the current snowpack make its way down into these into these reservoirs? Uh, we saw we've seen an, we've seen quite a large increase in the California reservoirs. So Lake Shasta, for example, is sitting pretty close to its long-term average. That's being managed uh, for for water capture and for flood. 
the maps or the graphs on the right I think are fairly interesting. It's a, a from the CNAP program and it's a way to visualize how much water is both in the reservoirs and in the snowpack combined. So the map on the top right is showing the, the blue is the the all of the reservoirs upstream of Lake Powell. Uh, the gray peak is the average snowpack. The red lines are what we've seen this year. So all of the reservoirs are sitting a little below average, but our snowpack is following that average curve. Um, that would be on the upper Colorado River Basin fairly closely. The graph on the bottom shows the similar data, but it includes some green lines, and that's adding Lake Powell to the mix uh, of all of those. Um, and when you add Lake Powell to the upper basin storage, uh, we see that with that storage and the snowpack, we're sitting above average for this time of the season. And this is a, a forecast of the expected stream flow into Lake Powell over the months of April through July. So the squiggly blue line is what the forecasts have said and how the forecasts have changed over time. Um, and the, the green lines represent the long-term average. So uh, back in early December, the, it was, we were, the forecast was suggesting maybe per, perhaps below average stream flow into Lake Powell for that April through July period. But as we've seen the snowpack increase, those forecasts have increased that expected inflow also that we're sitting up, we're expect, currently expecting above average inflow, but pretty far from the record set in 1984. I wanted to quickly get into the outlooks. What are we expecting over the next few weeks and months? So what I'm first showing is what, what can we expect for the rest of March? The top two graphs are temperature and precipitation for the next 10 days, uh, six to 10 days. So it's eight, March 18th through the 22nd. Um, and the bottom two are the eight to 14 day outlook. And all four ma maps are suggesting a cool and wet pattern con continuing with us through March. Although as we look beyond March, there's a chance for a change in the long-term outlook. We're seeing perhaps a warm and dry period, uh, a warm and dry change coming in that, uh, that the spring ahead may be a little different than what we've seen over winter. Um, this change based on the top two maps, the three to four week temperature and precipitation outlook, this change may begin as early as, um, as early April. So the forecasts are suggesting that change. Looking beyond the next season, uh, we usually look at things like El Nino and La Nina to give us an idea of what the rest of the year or what the, the forecast might look like for the next 12 months. Uh, we're just coming out of a La Nina pattern. In fact, officially last week, NOAA declared that La Nina is over, which is the, the graphs that are, the maps and the graph I'm showing on the left. In the middle are our forecasts, uh, which are pretty interesting because there's a bit of a divide between our statistical models and our, our physics-based models, but not a huge one. The, our statistical models are suggesting maybe a neutral condition will be persisting through the end of the year and into autumn and winter, um, which would carry us through even into early 2024. But our dynamical models, which are based on physics uh, and the physical patterns within in the atmosphere, uh, they're suggesting we may switch pretty quickly into an El Nino pattern. Um, you can see that in the, the graphs of probabilities on the bottom in the center, where the red bars represent uh, the percent chance that an El Nino will develop. And odds are favoring an El Nino by the beginning of autumn. What does that mean for the Southwest? Well, generally, you can see the maps on the right. These are composites of of previous El Nino events, and generally, El Nino winter, uh, El Nino falls and winters will bring wetter and cooler um, weather to the Southwest. Now, every El Nino is different, and there still is a lot that can change. In fact, um, the farther out we look, the more fuzzy the forecasts become. Through spring, we have a, a predictability barrier that we're trying to forecast through. So there's a lot of uncertainty looking forward from here. But right now, we're keeping an eye on this El Nino to see how it plays out. Um, that summarizes our current weather and climate conditions, and I'll pass back to you, Emily. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Joel. And now we will turn it over to Henry Regis to hear about Coco Ross. Thanks, Emily. Uh, let me show my screen here in one second. Um, I think this will work. And... If I get going here with the slideshow. Ah, there. Can you guys see it? Yep, it looks great. Great. Well, let me tell you again, thank you for inviting uh, me today to talk about Coco Ross. We're the Community Collaborative Rain, Hail, and Snow Network. I know Emily gave an introduction on that. 
And I'll go through the slides pretty quickly here. We want to cover a lot of stuff in a short amount of time. Um, our, our main goal at Cocoa Ross is to provide high quality precipitation measurements and educational resources and outreach for the public. And so we want to do that throughout the, the Southwest. Uh, Cocoa Ross was born in response to the 1997 Fort Collins flood. We had a flood that took five lives and uh, put down a lot of precipitation in a short amount of town. There's a time. This is a, a quick shot from the Fort Collins area. Uh, you can see on the bottom right the the um, library campus. Uh, they just moved all the books for renovation to the basement, and unfortunately that got flooded out. Um, the flood did point out a couple of things. So if you take a look at the map there, point A uh, is on the west side of town up against the foothills. 14 and a half inches of rain on the point B, five miles away, only two inches of rain. And that picture in the top right, that's me standing there uh, by Spring Creek. Spring Creek is usually a trickle as it goes through. Uh, and you can see I'm about six foot two, so you can see the high water mark there as it, as it pushed through. Uh, what we learned was the extreme local variations in rainfall possible from convective storms, and then the important role individuals can play in measuring, mapping, and reporting the precipitation that falls. Uh, again, we started in 1998. A few dozen volunteers in northern Colorado. Uh, are now in, in 2023, we're celebrating our 25th anniversary. 25, over 25,000 volunteers in all 50 states: Canada, Puerto Rico, U.S. Virgin Islands, Bahamas, and Guam. You can see a quick picture there of the density across the the uh, Canada and the U.S. Uh, volunteers of all ages and backgrounds can participate in the citizen science project. Observers are trained and daily to take daily measurements of precipitation at their locations. And here's the Coco Ross website. So if you haven't been there, there's the URL at the bottom. A lot of great information out there, and this updates daily uh, with precip that falls across the U.S. Uh, we measure just precip, so it's rainfall data. Uh, we've become the largest source of daily precip measurements in the U.S. Snowfall data, uh, volunteers measure both snowfall depth, the new and accumulated, as well as the water content, the SWE of the snow that falls. And then we also do hail, so we become one of the largest repositories of hail data in the United States. And talking about snow, just a couple of quick pictures here. Uh, we do what's called SWE Mondays, so uh, no risk up in Chanhassen, Minnesota uses a lot of our snow water equivalent measurements. Over 75% of those that they receive come from Kokoros volunteers. And uh, you can see some deep snow. That's a, a gentleman in Canada on the, on the left and on the right was about a week ago here in Western Colorado. So the snowpack is deep, but again, it's good to have people out there in remote locations so we know what is on the ground and the potential for that snowpack that, as it melts. Uh, we use a four inch diameter high capacity plastic rain gauge, about $35. Uh, there's the gauge on the right there. The uh, inner tube uh, holds one inch of precipitation. Uh, you can measure down to the hundredth of an inch and the whole gauge holds 11, almost 11 and a half inches. Uh, a new gauge coming out this spring, the Tropo precipitation gauge, uh, will be a, a, the next generation four inch gauge, a little bigger, um, and it's got a handle on it and so forth. There's a the group called Climactic is, is putting this together. We've tested it, it works really well. And this is great for areas where you get a lot of uh, precipitation. So uh, if you guys are interested in that, that that'll be available uh, through a, a couple of different sites here in, in the future. The observers uh, report their 24 hour precipitation each morning around 7 a.m. Um, and they can do it by their app or online. And we have observation notes here. So the observation notes give them a chance to, especially for snowfall or heavy rain, to verify what fell. Um, and you can see the, the note in there. And each, each person that signs up gets a station location and station number. So that is an important thing for identifying where the station is. There's a look, uh, well, the, the observers, uh, once they uh, report that, goes right to the map. And it's available for the public to view and use. All this data is free out there for anyone who would like to, to use it. There's a, just a, a typical day, or I think this accumulated day, a uh, couple days uh, across the nation. We have an interactive mapping system. Here's a look at the Salt Lake area. Um, and so this shows uh, February 26th through March 9th. 
you can see you can zoom in all these different options on the right get a chance to play around with the map it's kind of fun to look at um, and you can see what fell in, in your area uh, and then we can drill right down to the city level with that map here's a look at las cruces uh, of last uh, spring and for a uh, accumulated period so you can really get an idea uh, especially over more densely populated areas what fell where we're hoping to have more observers throughout the southwest right now we're doing pretty good but uh, 3100 almost 3200 active observers and there they are by state so colorado leads with uh, over 1400 uh next we have new mexico and arizona have done great uh, we're really hoping to get more folks in Utah to observe and also in Nevada where, uh, again, some sparse places out there uh, where a lot of times we don't have observers. Uh, volunteers data. So if you're a volunteer, you're uh, is permanently archived and available in a bunch of summer reports that we put out there. Here's a look at the water year. We've got some great graphics and stuff for each person uh, that has a station. And then uh, all the data is archived at NCEI's uh, part of their Global Historical Climate Network, the daily part of that. Once you make 100 observations, that's where they're all, uh, they start to go archive, be archived there. And you say rural counties, well, you know, out in the West, we don't have a lot of, a lot of people, but uh, some places have really done really well. And if you look here, Liberty County, Montana on the right, only 1,900 folks live there, but look at that, over, over 20, uh, observers and then in parts of rural Kansas 16 so uh, it can be done and uh, we you know the more folks reporting the better we get of a picture of what fell where a lot of folks using our observations out there from weather forecast <clears throat> weather forecasters engineering agricultural researchers uh, uh, again the data is used by uh, wide by uh, by many folks and then we do something too called uh, real-time significant weather reports where folks can go in, they can report heavy rainfall uh, that's or, or snow uh, or hail that's falling in the area that goes immediately to the National Weather Service's AWIP stations. They get an alarm on there, and that often provides critical information uh, for uh, the issuance of maybe flash flood warnings or severe thunderstorm warnings. Here's a quick uh, example in the Providence, Rhode Island area. You can see the radar as the storms moved in from the right is a person reported uh, one inch uh, in, uh, I guess it was less than 15 minutes. And uh, and so that uh, led to some issuance of some flash flood warnings uh, for that metropolitan area. So again, some great stuff, extra eyes and ears out there to help the weather service along. Well, drought is another big part of our network. And when it doesn't rain, drought awareness, uh, we report through condition monitoring. And we, one thing we do, uh, is ask our observers also always to report zero. So when it doesn't rain, put that zero in. It's important to know where it has rained and where it hasn't. Uh, take a look here, the condition, we call this condition monitoring. We ask folks once a week, if they can, every Sunday, if possible, to observe a report in their area. So what, what does it look like in your, your, your landscape? What's it like on the ground? And there's a, there's a scale bar there. There's an interactive map with the drought monitor laid behind it, behind it, and uh, you can kind of see uh, all the different reports that have come in. We can zoom down a little bit. Here's one in Las Cruces, that little triangle down there, and they have a chance to put some anecdotal information, which really helps uh, the drought monitor authors as they look across the country to see what has fallen where. Uh, and here's the form. There's, so there's an easy reporting form here on the right. You can just click right along. And then we have uh, some great uh, information on the, the right-hand side, some uh, PowerPoints there, which show you how to, uh, how to put that information in and what to use as a guide for, for that. Uh, so consider being an observer at your location. If you're on this webinar, you may, you may already know about Cocoros, but maybe you've not heard of it. And so we could certainly use more reports throughout the West. Um, and so again, we ask you to do that. It's easy to do. So here you go really quickly as we wind things up, five easy steps. Sign up on the Kokoros webpage, uh, obtain that four inch plastic rain gauge. They're available from numerous distributors on our website. View the training slideshows we have out there. Um, right now, there's not many training sessions going on. And then find a good spot in, in your yard, your backyard, your front yard, wherever a good location away from trees, 
and then start observing. You know, the worst thing is to keep the gauge in the box. So once you get that, get out there and, and put that information in. And we have easy online training. We've got a bunch of animations out there which make it really easy for folks to look at. Uh, coming up this spring, later this spring, we've got a data dashboard. We're gonna be releasing that. And it's got all kinds of things for each observer station to look at. Uh, anybody can view this, but uh, dials and different gauge, uh, things that fill up calendars, all this information is a, a kind of a gift back to folks for reporting it. So that'll be coming up soon. And so you might say, well, we don't have observers in our area. We don't have a lot of people, but hey, you know what? We, we do what we can. And uh, uh, we had a, an observer out here in, in Colorado and, and uh, he was good for a while, but he kept spilling the gauge. He drink out of the gauge. We had to let him go after time. But uh, anyway, there's my information down there. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out and that's it. Excellent. Thank you so much, Henry. Um, Credel, are there any questions that you'd like to ask of either of the presenters? Thank you so much to our presenters, both Joel and Henry. And thank you, um, Emily. Um, the one question that came in was for Joel, and it is a question about the relationship between the departure from La Nina and the arrival of El Nino and its relationship to the atmospheric river pattern that we've been seeing and if that could change and whether the warmer storms with higher elevation freezing points are related to the real, to the departure of La Nina and arrival of El Nino. Okay, uh, thanks for whoever asked that question. That's actually a really tricky one to try to unpack. Um, as as best as, as I understand and uh, I've read a little bit about this, but I, I don't think I consider myself an expert on the atmospheric rivers, but they're they're more closely related to what's going on in the northern Pacific than what's going on in the central. Uh, when we see a persistent Arctic low pressure forming over like the Aleutian Islands area, that, that tends to sort of constrain this water vapor pattern and we tend to get more of these atmospheric rivers when when we have that Arctic low moving south over the Pacific. Um, there's there's not really a strong tie between what's going on in in the central pacific like the the pacific ocean temperatures like what's happening with el nino and la nina and these atmospheric rivers although i'd really want to do more investigation of like what happened this year to make so many atmospheric rivers happen and was that tied to a declining la nina or a weak la nina um, and that's something that i really don't have a good answer for Thank you so much. And the, the only other question that came in uh, for Henry was, does the monitoring, when you're doing the monitoring um, as a participant volunteer, do you also record temperature or is it solely the precipitation data? Yeah, we're, we're just recording precipitation data. In your observation notes, you're welcome to put temperature in there and, or anything else that you like. Uh, but yeah, we're just recording precip. Excellent, thank you. And those were the only questions we had today. All right, thanks so much to Joel Lisenby and to Henry Regis for their presentations today. Our next call will be April 18th and we're gonna hear about snowpack conditions and some um, how that translates to some river forecasts. So this webinar will be um, posted in a few days up on drought.gov. This concludes our webinar, thank you.